thank you for being here today. I'm Larry Allums, uh, Executive Director of the Dallas Institute of Humanities and Culture. Please continue enjoying your first course. I welcome you to our 14th annual awarding of the Hyatt Prize in the Humanities, the largest and most distinctive prize of its kind in the U.S. Endowed by Kim Hyatt Jordan, the Hyatt Prize identifies emerging leaders in the humanities and supports them with a cash award at a time, I dare say, in their careers when they need it most, when they're young. The Dallas Institute's mission is to enrich and deepen the practical life of the city with the wisdom and imagination of the humanities. We give priority to the life of the mind and the human spirit, to learning, and at the same time aim at having an impact on our way of life, our culture. So please welcome to the podium our honorary chair for the 2018 Hyatt Prize Award, Brill Garrett. Good afternoon. Welcome to the 14th annual Hyatt Prize in the Humanities Luncheon. What a thrill it is for me to be here today with you to celebrate humanities and one of my favorite things, the Dallas Institute. Thank you for being here. It's my distinct pleasure to introduce our special guest speaker, Dr. Christopher LeBron. He joins us as the Associate Professor in Philosophy at John Hopkins University. His impressive education includes earning his PhD from MIT in Social Theory and Political Philosophy. Wow. <laughs> To provide some context on this degree, Dr. LeBron attended Hunter College for one year and then dropped out. He had some sales jobs and then returned to college full time as a wiser and older student. Then he went on to earn his degree. His first book, The Color of Our Shame, Race and Justice in Our Time, was published in 2013 and won the American Political Science Association Foundations of Political Theory First Book Prize. He followed this important work with the making of Black Lives Matter. This book gives a brief intellectual history of the Black Lives Matter social movement. He traces the origins of the movement and connects it to the struggle for freedom and equal rights for African Americans. You may find articles and book reviews written by Dr. LeBron in publications such as the New York Times, the Boston Review, and the Chronicle for Higher Education. He describes his work this way, to deal deeply with human affect and the effects of social injustice on questions of imagination, motivation, and reasoning. Dr. LeBron grew up on the Lower East Side of Manhattan as for books, science fiction is at the top of his list. He cites the enduring books for him as the first three books in Madeline L'Engle's Time Quintet, also my favorites. Music has always been a big part of his life as his dad was part of a professional salsa band along with his brothers. Dr. LeBron himself began playing the saxophone in fourth grade. Since the earliest age he could own one, Dr. LeBron was never far from his Walkman. Hopefully everyone remembers what that is. <laughs> he describes himself as an introvert and enjoys the company of his own mind. He loves to write and to systematize observations and arguments. He appreciates precision in language and statements. To provide some balance, he is also an avid gamer. Please give Dr. LeBron a warm welcome. Good afternoon. Thank you all for being here. Um, it is true I do like the company in my own mind, but you folks have been swell, and I really appreciate that. Um, it's a great honor to stand up here today as a recipient of this year's higher prize. You know, our nation is in no shortage of people doing brilliant work in the public sphere um, across many, many ranges of topics, um, and to be recognized by the Dallas Institute for my work um, is an honor to me, not only vis-a-vis -vis the Institute, but also vis-a-vis -vis my colleagues who are doing the good work of trying to keep the torch of intellectual light alive in America. So it's a great pleasure to be here today. <clears throat> and I thank 
Ms. Jordan for endowing the prize and making it possible for previous, previous winners and for future winners as well. Um, I'll apologize ahead of time, I'm a New Yorker. Um, I had to leave New York to realize how fast I can speak. Um, and so I, I apologize ahead of time. Um, I have about 20, 25 minutes to offer my address and I've written it um, to make sure I do not violate time constraints that Dr. Allums very gently reminded me of about six times by email. The title of my address today is somewhere between hope and tragedy, race and the blues of American politics. There's a choice that black Americans have to make about America every day of their lives. In a land marked by measurable and terribly enduring forms of structural inequalities across domains as disparate as rates of incarceration, income, real estate holdings, access to health care, and healthy food, black folks have to ask themselves, why is America worth it? To put things starkly and succinctly, three centuries of life in a nation that has seen more change than progress asks a lot of a people whose very bodies are daily targets of various forms of disdain and repulsion. It saddens me to say that the question of America's worth to black folks is especially sharp these days. I make no apology in identifying our current administration as mired in a form of over and explicit racism not seen in politics for many decades. Further, it is our duty to note the rise of the current president on the immediate heels of the most momentous and public civil rights campaign seen in America since the 60s. Black Lives Matter rose in direct response to the plague of institutional racial murder that the public finally was forced to stop denying existed. So how does a black person today square the promise of America with its troubled present against the backdrop of its treacherous and morally low racial history? Is America worth weathering the lows? The question puts me in mind of some lines from Bessie Smith's Backwater Blues, and I'll spare you my singing and just read the lyrics. When it thunders and lightning, and when the wind begins to blow, when it thunders and lightning, and the wind begins to blow, there's thousands of people ain't got no place to go. Backwater Blues done call me to pack my things and go. Backwater Blues done call me to pack my things and go, because my house fell down and I can't live there no more. <clears throat> is the House of America fallen? In my brief time today, I want to set before you three very important ideas that the humanities allow us to use in grappling with this question, hope, tragedy, and the blues. This is usually the point in an address when I say, I will argue today for, and then list my point. Today, I can't say I have an argument for you because I don't know the answer to the question I'm asking. And if I accomplish anything here today, it will be to make you less certain of America's worth, if for no other reason than to fight more vigorously for its salvation. So let's begin with the idea of hope. It is a word about which we hear a lot these days from various quarters. But it bears thinking about what is really meant when we talk about hope. A quick and direct way of engaging hope is comparing it to faith. When one says one has faith, often one is saying one is choosing to believe something choosing to adopt a critical stance in absence of adequate evidence to believe in that thing <clears throat> or adopt that stance. <clears throat> I want to emphasize, I am not saying this makes faith a bad thing to adopt. Rather, it requires the proverbial leap into the unknown. Hope works differently. If I go on a job interview, for example, and I say I hope to get the job, that properly requires that I performed well, dressed properly, held the proper credentials, and I'm a good fit for the organization. If I don't do these things and say I hope to get the job, then all I am really doing is fantasizing. I don't have any good reasons to hope for the job, and actually I have no reason to believe I, won't, I will get it. Here's what makes hope a special idea. Let's say I did all the right things. It could still be the case that I don't get the job for any number of perfectly legitimate reasons. Many other people applied, and another person was just that much more qualified, and so on. Hope, then, is a double-edged idea. It keeps us attuned to possibly fortuitous events in the future while properly acknowledging that we can fail to attain the hoped-for outcome. Let us now pivot to tragedy. It's an unfortunate truism that bad things can happen to good people. But why should that trouble us as much as it sometimes does? I think it has something to do with the idea of deservingness. It is tragic that a person who spends their lives giving to the poor should one day, due to the capriciousness of capital labor markets, 
find themselves deemed too old to hold on a job to a job in technology and themselves fall into destitution because of it. This is a person that deserved better. But think about that. If the person did in fact deserve better, who was meant to ensure that that person get what they deserved? This question is less to the point when something is cosmically tragic. You've lived the life of a health nut and nonetheless developed a debilitating disease. You've sent your child off to school not knowing it was the last time you'd see them. But things change when we speak about more traceable tragedies. Young black kids going to freezing schools in the inner city while white children enjoy high-tech learning environments in the suburbs. A black woman shot by the police when she was the one calling for help, while a white woman who harasses a black passerby in her neighborhood does so with no consequence. To be sure, some of these things do happen to bad people, but the trouble with a society like ours, home to enduring structural inequalities, we know one thing for certain, Bad things also happen to good people for no other reason than those people are darker than the rest. Let us call this the American tragedy. It is real. It preemptively forces people into inadequate housing, poor schooling, incarceration, joblessness. But need it force people into hopelessness? The remarkable thing about the blues tradition is that it holds two ethical positions at once. First, that life can be filled with tragedy. Second, that we must face it and move on in the face of tragedy. This is deeply important since once one is born black in America, there is very little to be done about that fact. Despite that race is itself a fictitious category, what other people and institutions make of it is absolutely real. Thus, black folks must make essential sense of the situation of living something that can often look and be experienced as a cursed life just for drawing breath into one's lungs. How does one do this? The blues has a key to this puzzle. Consider the following from the great American essayist, James Baldwin. I quote, the blues are rooted in the slave songs. The slaves discovered something genuinely terrible, terrible because it sums up the universal challenge, the universal hope, the universal fear. The very time I thought I was lost, my dungeon shook and my chains fell off. Well, that is almost all I am trying to say. I say that out of great concern and out of a kind of hope. If you can live in the full knowledge that you are going to die, that you are not going to live forever, that if you live with the reality of death, you can live. This is not mystical talk. It is a principal fact of life. If you can't do it, if you spend your entire life in flight from death, you are also in flight from life." End quote. So now, I have handed you three ideas. Hope, tragedy, and the blues. And now we ought to do something with them. The title of this address is Somewhere Between Hope and Tragedy, Race and the Blues of American Politics. It is my position that blacks live in a kind of unrelenting tension between hope, hoping for a better America and the tragedies it unendingly imposes on us. But now remember that I said that an appropriate hope is one that is grounded in facts that provide proper reason for hope. Yet, centuries of racial abuse that now see our moment dominated by a racist government for many, for many renders the reasons of hope in America improper. I want to emphasize that what we are seeing today in American politics is not some unprecedented anomaly. Indeed, the current president simply lost patience with dog whistles, and many, many Americans were glad for it. Previous administrations, Republican and Democratic, have had their hands in the oppression cookie jar as well. It is this long-standing, poorly kept secret of America's devastating racial vice that bookends black life with tragedy. It makes lots of bad things happen to many good people. Say that these are not cosmic tragedies. Indeed, our ability to call these things an injustice hinges on the fact that we can explain the nature and mechanics of these injustices. Above, Bessie Smith sings of being driven out of a home by a force of nature. She reckons with this forthrightly. The backwater blues done called on her to pack her things, and even though she has no place to go. In my heart of hearts, I often feel as if this song is an apt metaphor for black life in America. The sturm and drang of races and batters the shores of decency, causing many of us to consider our options. One blunt reality we share with Smith's classic is that, realistically, black folks have no place else to go. Yet, that need not counsel hope as a fallback option. Somewhere between hope and tragedy is a strength of resistance and imagination to flourish in society that holds more promise than any other, but for that reason, whose basic failures are more pathetic and pitiful than any others. Somewhere between hope and tragedy are those who, alongside black folks, 
know better, but lack the conviction of their morals. And somewhere between hope and tragedy is America, in America is the possibility of a land that finally comes to be what has always promised, a nation defined by commitment to universal human dignity. Between there and us are those people institutions too frightened of the future to see that everyone benefits from a just society. To make good on hope and put an end to explainable tragedy, it is our duty to push our way to the future. It is the one and only greatness America ever promised us. Who are they to tell us to accept tragedy over hope? I refuse, and so should you. Thank you. We are now going to have a bit of a conversation. <clears throat> we may have some time, since you were so scrupulous with your, with your time constraints. Thank you for that. We may have some time for some questions from you all. Okay, so we're going to start with, with some conversation. A couple of things about you, Chris. You're, you're only the second winner in 14 years in philosophy and the first in political philosophy. So it sort of prompts a question in me, what attracted you to philosophy? So um, I appreciate the question. So uh, the answer begins with something maybe not especially profound, but I've always been interested and compelled by what I consider to be the human condition, the possibility for greatness, and often the failure to achieve greatness. Um, and there's many ways you can approach that question, but um, I'm a person who likes to work in the realm of ideas and maybe abstractions. Um, and so I turn to philosophy um, and political thought as a way to at least get one point of entry into why aren't we as great as a species and as a nation as, as we could be. And so philosophy gave me that first step to pursue my interest in the human condition. So, so to, to um, reflecting on your talk, um, which had many profound aspects, I, I thought back to your, of course I wrote this before I came here, but um, I, I thought back again as you were talking to your Hyatt application. Okay, and this is the way you begin the narrative part of it. The overarching ambition for my work since entering graduate school in 2004 has been to clarify the nature of racial disadvantage from the perspective of being a minority as well as the threat racial marginalization poses to the future of American democracy given both its deep past and tragic present. You remember writing that? Yeah. Sounds good. <laughs> yeah, it does. <laughs> I was impressed. <laughs> and so were our judges. And then you say in that same narrative that something began to change in your motivation. You desired to reach, in your words, multiple publics, not just your peers in the academy. And so often, peers in the academy are accused of just talking to each other, right? So can you talk about this evolution in your thinking? No, so um, I have a very, very dear friend who, um, uh, when I became a professor at University of Virginia, and I had no intention on writing for the public, um, but we would have these conversations. He also worked in the political philosophy of race and democratic ethics, and we'd have these conversations, and I, you know, I was working through my first book, and he would tell me, um, you know, good luck when you start writing you know, for the public, for you know, New York Times, whatever the case is. And I said, dude, you have no idea what you're talking about. I'm never going to do that. That's not for serious people. Because I still was under the kind of sociological pull of the academy as being the only legitimate source for, quote unquote, big ideas. And it was a bad way to think about the nature of ideas. But what he was directing me towards and what I thankfully came to realize is that to engage the big ideas and stay true to my interest in the human condition was precisely to try and engage the tonality and the register of these ideas for a wider audience because the human condition is all of us, not just the people in the academy. And so I came to start feeling that if I started doing the work I was doing, I wanted to do it not only well, but sincerely. I think academic work is not only about the best argument, but it's about being honest. And a lot of my colleagues, I'm sorry to say, are not, I might say they're not honest, not that they're being intentionally deceptive, but they're not coming to a, a, a realization about the nature of their own work. But I wanted to be honest, and in being honest with what I wanted to do and to try and make, in my own way, a genuine contribution to the problem, um, I started pointing my work outward. So would you consider yourself, have you ever been called a public intellectual? <laughs> Larry. Um, so some people have called, have called me that. Um, 
it's a, that term is fraught in many ways in the public um, in, in America. On the one hand, it's fraught because in the academy to be called a public intellectual is to by almost default to not be a serious intellectual. Yeah. Um, but on the other hand, there are so many people parading on CNN, C-SPAN, Fox as intellectuals, and I'm sorry, I get to throw a little bit of shade being on screen, they're not. Um, <laughs> But, but because they get big checks for their speaking engagements. So, they, so on the one hand, academics have taken the intellectual, out, have taken the public out of the intellectual. Now on the other hand, public intellectuals have taken the intellectual out of the public intellectual. And what you have left are people trying to redefine in some coherent, strong way what it means to help support honest, vigorous, clear public discourse, which is the Institute's mission, which I have come to admire um, more and more in speaking to all of you in the room, it's clear that this is a, a overriding ethos. Mm -hmm. um, but, that is, but that is how I see it. And so when people call it me, how I react depends on who it is that calls, because it can be a term of denigration. And for others, it's almost a term of, well, you get to write for you know, the Atlantic, so you're somebody fancy, and I'm not. Um, <laughs> so, but I, I like to think that I am, but in the very kind of literal sense. I, I try to do intellectual work for the public, nothing more, nothing less. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, we're the Dallas Institute of Humanities and Culture, and so we, of course, want to perpetuate and promulgate the humanities in public life. Uh, would you say that it requires people like you being public in order to, because we hear so much today about the humanities being under fire, right, you know, so it, you know, I, 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 think, I, think, I think people like um, me, and there are many of us, and within my field of philosophy, one of the things I've been heartened by is that there's a younger generation that has lost, that is losing patience with the kind of staid, slow slog of academic work. Not that there isn't virtue in taking your time with work. That's also a virtue which in America we don't do enough. But on the other hand, um, these are young folks who, you know, they're on social media, um, they, they're reading widely, both in the academy and in intelligent public forums, and they want to be doing work and, and writing stuff that can make, that can reach. And I think in another, you know, decade or so, the field of philosophy generally will look very different because there's a generation coming up that is losing patience with these channels of power that, that, con that convey legitimacy with, with no connection to how the world is actually functioning. And good for them, I hope they succeed. And I'm definitely one of the people that is hoping to you know, help light the way in my own small way. And I think your number is growing, uh, or that's my perception anyway, the number of people who are willing to speak publicly. That's correct. Yeah. So, um, and it, it, to, to that point, your latest book, The Making of Black Lives Matter, is, I hope this is not insulting, is incredibly readable. Yeah. <laughs> it really is. I mean, there, and there's a dramatic uh, sense to it. You know, it, it has a, a plot. It has a story. You know, so I encourage all of you, you, you are receiving the book, and I encourage all of you to read it because it is, it is the most enlightening thing. Uh, you know, I think I, I feel like I understand the movement now. But you say in there that you... you um, you, it, it's a movement that seeks, this is what the way you describe the movement, it's a movement that seeks to finally undo this nation's murderous racial history. But to write about it directly is not your aim. Right? You know, so could you tell us a little bit about the background? Of so, um, you know, the movement um, thankfully got a lot of attention um, nationwide. Um, and one of the reasons why the movement was able to get the attention it did really had to do with technology to really put it as plainly as possible. Um, the stuff that you were seeing on an unending news cycle a number of years ago, that's nothing new. This has been happening for decades and decades and decades since black bodies landed in America um, and since slaves were let off the plantation and during Jim Crow. All that change was that no one could deny it anymore. You had irrefutable proof that these bodies were being abused. So what that meant was that this is a movement that was not addressing a new problem. It had not had an opportunity to leverage a technology that allowed them to provide evidence. So what the movement was really doing was being in conversation with centuries of thinking about what it means to inhabit its skin and inhabiting that skin making you a kind of a target. Now the movement was not the first movement to think about that. There was civil rights movement, but before that there's a, a tradition of black American thought that had provided the kind of intellectual and conceptual infrastructure to help make this clear. What I was dis dissatisfied with with the movement was that it had people who were very strong on the ground 
and it, you know, these things happen, but it didn't have a manifesto. Black power in the 60s had a manifesto, for example. King had manifestos. The movement did not. Now, I did not set out to write a manifesto. I'm not qualified to do that. I'm not on the ground. But I did think that the academy could partner in a way, and I tried to move quickly to offer, at least from within my skill set, a narrative to the public and to a wider readership about what were the ideas the movement was in conversation with, even when the movement itself wasn't clear that it was in conversation with those ideas and these people, but they certainly were in conversation with Audre Lorde. They certainly were in conversation with Ida B. Wells. I wanted to try and, and provide that bridge. So, and, and this is what you call, in your book, <clears throat> the uh, effort to provide the philosophical moorings of Black Lives Matter. That's you know, correct. That's what you wanted to do. And uh, so, and you asked the central question, what can those who have been on the front lines in the past teach us about our present ideas about the struggle? So that's sort of the motivation of the book. We had a speaker uh, at the, uh, uh, an apologist for the humanities at the Institute not long ago, who said that the most serious threat to the humanities today is what he called presentism. And, you know, an open disregard of the past and its wisdom accumulated through the centuries. And we see that publicly, you know, uh, even with elected officials. So could you tell us a little bit about your stance toward the past, right? The, the past that we don't know, that we need to know, and just, you know, the importance of things. I mean, there's, there's a very tricky relationship we can all have with the past on the one hand. We should never forget, but then you, can, you should ought not have um, what um, uh, Sadia Hartman calls a wounded attachment to the past. The past should be there as educational tool, but we live for the future. We only move forward in one direction. And so as we set foot you know, in front of the other to move towards tomorrow, the past should be a critical guide to it, but we should not be moored in it. On the other hand, in America, um, again, due to technology, but I also just think it's the American way. It's, you know, everything's got to be happening five minutes ago. And that does make us very presentist. And something like Twitter, on the one hand, is extremely helpful and useful for democratizing voice. But on the other hand, everyone's trying to figure out the cleverest way to say something that will be the favorite thing in about five minutes from now. Mm -hmm. And what that tends to do is directs our attention away from slowing down and taking stock of why this stuff matters. And so I do think presentism is a threat to the humanities because humanities is about taking stock, again, of the human condition, which we're not new, right? We've been doing this for many, 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 many centuries, thousands of years. And so we, we need to be taking into account what we've done before and where we've went wrong. History does repeat itself. And when it does, we only have ourselves to blame for not, understand, for not seeing the signs of it coming back around. And we could change that. Okay. And in this book, in The Making of Black Lives Matter, you pair... Uh, eight, you, you have four pairs of, of historic people from the past, from history, and you examine two of those in each of the chapters, right? And, and so in one of them, um, we're the Dallas Institute of Humanities and Culture, that's our other word, and so we're interested in issues of culture. And in one of your chapters about Langston Hughes and Zora Neale Hurston, you make the, and the Harlem Renaissance, you, you title it, cultural control against social control. What do you see as the difference between those two? So um, I use the Harlem Renaissance as, a, as, a, as an example because when you think about the term the Harlem Renaissance, it should strike you as a little bit odd. Renaissance is the return of something, but black folks had just really gotten to Harlem and taken the neighborhood for themselves. So if it was a Harlem Renaissance, what was a return to? And this is the puzzle. And what it turns out is the Harlem Renaissance was really a way of presenting itself as a mode of enlivening the imagination of white Americans to a new and enlivened um, facet of black life. So it was a creation of something that had always been there for black folks, but had not been there for anybody else, which is why I posit it was called a renaissance. When you can do that, when you can use art, when you can use the arts and letters, when you can use novels, when you can use visual arts, when you can use theater to impact imagination, you are presenting a form of power. You are engaging in a mode of discourse that influences, even manipulates, hopefully manipulates in a good way. But to tap affect, to tap imagination, is to start to pivot people in ways they otherwise would not, which is why we try to engage them in these ways in order to get them to see the world from a different perspective. Once you can do that, you have a kind of a, of a, of a, of a stronghold against the politics and policies that seek in their own right 
to repress modes of living and modes of expression, which is why freedom of expression is so fundamentally important. And we seem to fight about it in America almost every minute of every day. So when you can have control of your culture, you can provide some bulwark against political and economic control. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, in, 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 of course, those two figures are controversial today in many ways. I mean, you know, Zornel Hurston and her use of the idioms, you know, which she's so wonderful at. So, you know, they are not without their controversy going back to those sort of fundamental figures in black history. I don't think you can, I, I don't think any artist of any race, of any social group can ever be considered a pathfinder um, and then not be controversial in the future. Because, you know, we take this for granted, but at the moment that you're doing something, you have to be breaking some rules to do it. You have to be finding your own way, which is what makes you a pathfinder. And there isn't a pathfinder who has gotten it right every step of the way, which is why I think it's often unfair to retroactively visit Langston Hughes 70 years later and say X, Y, and Z about him. Not that these people are not open to criticism in, in any real sense, but these kinds of ad hominem critiques of, oh, you know, we use, you know, she used idioms. Also, she had this oddly conservative libertarian aspect that seemed to be counter to black progressivism. And there's a way to clear the noise and rescue what we want from these people. What's also deeply important to be very plain and blunt about it, we seem to do it for white intellectuals all the time. And it only seems to be black intellectuals who we ourselves seem to hold some high standard of high holiness, which seems remarkably unfair. So mm -hmm. this is why they're there. Well, I want to go back to your, you had a good hour with Chris Boyd on Think Yesterday. And I, I, I don't want to call attention in a critical way to this caller, but the call did prompt some really provocative thoughts from you when this caller said, how can we produce more Michelle Obamas? And you said, that's not the right way to think about it. The right way to think about it is not to make the exception the rule, but make the rule acceptable. Right. No, that's exactly right. There is this... Um, you know, um, I'll try to avoid the blue language, but you know, Chris Rock has a joke. You know, he lives in one of the richest neighborhoods in New Jersey, and he's only you know three black people who live there. On the one hand, is Mary J. Blige, one of the greatest you know R and B singers of all time. On the other side is you know Jay Z, one of the greatest black rappers of all time. He goes, and then the cross street, you no know guy who lives there, an effing dentist, right? Um, <laughs> And his point was that for him, to, for the three of them to live there, they had to be the absolute best at what they do. The guy across the street, he's not an exceptional periodontist. He just cleans teeth, right? Um, and the reason, the problem with the with the, the the question posed by the caller is that black exceptional black folks, of which I'm grateful they are, they're always seen as well. If you know Chris Rock can do it, or if whoever can do it, Michelle Obama could do it. Certainly anybody can do it. And that's not always true. There are exceptional people in the world. There are people who also get remarkably lucky. They're at the right time and the right place to talk to the right person who knows the other right person. Next thing you know, you're a president. And that's the way it can happen. Um, and so that's not the right way to think about it. The right way to think about it is providing egalitarian grounds for any exceptional person to rise, but more importantly, for any ordinary person to live a flourishing, ordinary life. There's no mm -hmm. shame in that whatsoever. Um, and when we think about that, that's when you get towards equality. You can't get equality by celebrating the exceptional. It doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. And that's what you talk about is the promise of American democracy. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. So in your chapter on Anna Julia Cooper and Audrey Lord, which I think you said you enjoyed working with those two figures more than any others in the book. And Audrey Lord, yes. Audrey especially, Lord. Especially. So you, but you take up a persistent issue in the Black Lives Matter movement. We've all heard it. What you describe as, quote, a common refrain to the slogan Black Lives Matter, which is the disingenuous retort, all lives matter. In my estimation, you give a really masterful critique of this common refrain. Could you talk about it to us today? No, sure. I mean, you know, the refrain "All Lives Matter" is obviously true. Um, the only reason why the three words "Black Lives Matter" um, are said is because how America has tended to work is all lives matter minus then some groups. In this case, Black Lives. So the only thing that the campaign for Black Lives Matter has tried to emphasize is that they want to be part of the equation not over and above, not special, not select. They want to be part of the equation of all lives matter, but to be a part of that equation, it's missing a component. You can't do good math missing a term in it, right? Um, and so they want to be one of the terms in the equation to equate to a successful America. And that's the only thing 
And I say only in scare quotes, that's the only thing the movement ever wanted was to just be seen as part of the big equation to make all lives matter. And the importance of your book then is that you put Black Lives Matter in the context of this whole history of African Americans and Africans in this country. That's right. Yeah, so, so the final two, the pair, the two forebears that you treat in your book are Martin Luther King Jr. and James Baldwin. Uh, who fought the fight against racial injustice during their lives in very different ways, one being out of this country for a good part of it. And yet you maintain that they share a very important conviction, quote, that love was the key to democratic redemption. Love was the key, is the key to democratic redemption. Could you speak about this very striking common ground that Dr. King and Baldwin well, That's right. Um, you know, um, <clears throat> I think it's come back in vogue a little bit to speak about, you know, love, Unfortunately, the good Kanye West has misused the term, but um, <clears throat> and for the wrong people, but we won't talk about that. Um, but th the idea of love is sometimes seen as a saccharine idea that if I say, <clears throat> I love you, um, it must mean that I unconditionally accept all things about you, but that's not really genuine love. Genuine love is having the disposition to be accepting, but to also struggle with people so that they can better each other. And that was at the core of what King and Baldwin were about. It wasn't love for the sake of others, wasn't kind of turn the other cheek, it wasn't forgive on all occasions. Actually, it could, it could include a certain kind of retribution because some people need to be checked in order to respect them in the right way. But love was really a conduit for showing people respect. And one way you respect other people is by respecting yourself. So the idea of love for the two of them was a way of being able to bundle a number of complex ideas and giving them harmony in ways that they otherwise seem to be in dissonance the idea of acceptance, the idea of forgiveness, but also the idea of resistance and radicalness and reparation and even retribution if necessary. When Baldwin went overseas, um, he said in a debate with Buckley when Cambridge 1965, and this is 1965, um, <clears throat> when he sees his, American, his, brother <clears throat> his fellow Americans overseas, no one else knows that, that person like he does and vice versa. What he was trying to say was that despite all the problems of America, um, we have shared a history that for better and for worse, we are in this together. And so we had better do something about it. And so for Baldwin, this idea of love as this kind of politically rich idea that makes accountability part of the equation alongside forgiveness is a robust idea that allows us in some sense redeem a nation that has been in trouble for quite some time. Thank you. So would anyone like to ask uh, Dr. LeBron a question or have a statement? Yes. What would you suggest two or three really basic things that if we walked out of here today, we could do to make the situation better? Okay. Um, well, so we, we're, the Dallas issues is the people who like to read and write, so they're probably taking notes here. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, um, one is to read widely. Um, the other one is to live widely. Um, so um, I don't know what your social networks are in here, um, but I don't know where you send your kids to school. Um, I have some guesses that are probably correct. Um, and my guess is that a lot of you aren't in contact with people outside of a circles like this, which is a very privileged and elite circle. Um, that's just being honest. Um, and I know this because having come to where I've come in life, um, and I'm grateful for my success, um, there aren't that many of us, and I know what my circles have tended to look like just because of how economics and opportunity work. Um, but, it, but we can be in touch with people outside of our lived lives if we actually just acknowledge those people. For example, my university, no one knows the staff. No one knows the staff. No one's friends with the staff. Right? And they're all very progressive people. But uh, you know, I've, this is a case at University of Virginia, it's a case at Yale, and it's a case at Johns Hopkins. Um, you know, all of us, with me as I'm the first black tenured professor of philosophy in its entire history, so that tells you one kind of a thing. And um, I should say all this, you don't need bad or mean people for these things to be true. These things just have their own inertia. Right? But all the staff who do all the cleaning, who get rid of our mess, who help us live in ways that we don't even notice the, the friction in our lives, these people are invisible to us, for example, right? You know, I get the young students asking me all the time, you know, they're very bright eyed, they walk to my office, they're about to graduate, and they go, what can I do to help change the world? And, and they think they have to do a thing, right? They think they have to start an NGO or some, and I said, the, 
the most important thing you could do is just be courageous with respect to the person in front of you. Um, and that seems like a small thing, but it isn't a small thing because it's always easy to think big, right? But when you start basic, right, um, that's when your moral mettle is actually challenged the most. And people come to see about themselves what they're willing to tolerate and what they're willing not to. And we can't do that unless we actually put ourselves in positions to actually widen the resources we have for understanding many lived lives in America. I think that's really the most basic thing many people, not the only thing, I can say something more dramatic like each of you can pick up and live somewhere different and spread out across Dallas. That would be an option too. And trust me, it would help. Um, but you're probably not going to do that. Um, so let's start something more simple, like friends. That's, that was too... That's all I got for now. <laughs> Is there another question? Yes. In reading some of your articles, I noticed the title, uh, Black Panther, the movie, why we deserve better or it's not what we deserve. And I thought it was such a model of virtue and nobility in a fantasy superhero film, and then the equality between the masculine and feminine and dimensions of consciousness. I'm just wondering what is the crux of that article? Um, so um, you, you should you know, go out and read it, make sure I'm not being kind of too fast and loose, but um, this nation has a long fantasy with respectability of Africanness, some mythological sense of the African noble. Um, and in the movie, the only two black Americans are summarily basically put to rest. Um, the, the American black man kills the only American black woman just so he can get his revenge. And then the character of Killmonger, the only American black man, even though he has African roots, um, he's lived under a situation of injustice. And it turns out that as he's trying to figure out his way of trying to, in some sense, get right with the world and get what he thinks um, black folks are owed globally, um, what the movie decides is the best way to deal with him is to exterminate him, which is deeply problematic because that's exactly a comfortable way of dealing with a person who's expressing a, a sentiment consistent with the Black Panther Party. Now, he could still lose that debate, for example, for those who have seen the movie. He could still lose the debate, but the movie actually refuses to take his position seriously. It transforms him from disaffected to a kind of dictatorial, dictatorial radical, which of course nobody really wants. And by doing that shift without taking his original position seriously, it makes him the easy person to dismiss. And of course, you get this black respectability politics basically moored in this kind of fantastical notion of the noble African. And at the end, the noble African comes back to America and what does he do? The neoliberal option starts programs. Um, and to me, that's the most safe, venue for, for a black film that they could have had. They had millions and millions and millions of viewers and in the end, their, their, their solution is, let's just do more of what we have been doing and the noble, respectable people will lead the way. And that just seems to me a, 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 a tragically lost opportunity to have a, a tough conversation about what is really owed to people and how should they get it. Even, even if, again, you side ultimately with the more respectable path, so to speak, the debate is not had in good faith and I think that's a failure of, of critical thinking. One more question. We have time for one more. Yes. Uh, so, uh, Dr. LeBron, I'm a psychiatrist by training, so I apologize. Feel free not to answer this question if you don't feel comfortable. We have very sim uh, lots of similarities in how we grew up in our experiences and uh, in walking the halls of major institutions in the hospital and seeing that I'm the only black guy or the only black doctor walking the halls. And um, I've come to embrace whatever my calling is, whatever that responsibility is, but it, it comes with exhaustion. Yes. And so... I don't know if it's a burden, if it's a privilege, I don't know what you call it, but I would, uh, I would ask you to teach us how you manage exhaustion. No, that, 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 that's a real and deep question, and the exhaustion really is real. Um, I think it's, it's, it, can, it, can think it can slip by a lot of people what it means to almost always be the only one. Um, and then all the ways in which you know, Du Bois, and this would be familiar to you, um, Du Bois, Posit the problem of you know, double consciousness, having to see yourself you know, through the world through your eyes and how the world sees you, and then always living 
through these, this double vision, um, which is a remarkable, it's not, and that's not the same thing as being sympathetic with somebody else, it's what it means to split yourself in two. So on the one hand, there's just a kind of phenomenological problem or difficulty of what it means to always be negotiating the world as you see it, then how you're seeing. Then there's the experiential problem of acting how you would normally want to act and then trying to modify how you might want to act, just in case it's not fitting with people where people are expecting of you. Then we rise to the level of being professional, like yourself or like myself, then there's what, am I, what, am, what do I owe now a whole population Right? It's hard to get to a place like this, on a stage like this, for which I'm grateful, and just say, well, it's all about me now. All right? On the other hand, I'm the one who has to lose sleep at night. Right? And so then there's other negotiation. What do I owe other people who did not get the chances I got? Then what is my job to help educate those who need to be educated in the ways only folks like us can educate them? Right? And so all of a sudden, you're involved in a number of negotiations. Let me give a different kind of example. You go to an academic conference, one's called the American Political Science Association Conference. Political theorists work on all kinds of problems, Machiavelli, you know, Thoreau, Locke. And at the end of the day, if you, they give a paper on Locke and people disagree on Locke, no one loses any sleep. Locke is dead, right? <laughs> Long gone, and at the end of the day, no one really cares that deeply. But if I give a paper on black rights and black respect and people disagree with me, there goes the rest of my afternoon, because now I have to figure out, we're not only having an intellectual conversation, we're having a conversation that people are experiencing today in ways that are mortally important. And so now if you can't get through people about how this is deeply important, now all of a sudden the work takes on a completely different resonance. My ability to sleep at night is not the same as a person, all due respect to Locke scholars, it does, it, it, it's not that deep for them, right? And so now you have these multiple levels of heaviness. And I, if there's anything people do today, I've just reviewed Kesey Lehman's Heavy for The Atlantic, and you should read that book because the word heavy is a real word for what it means to do what we do in the world. Um, and there is a weight. That being said, that being said, I don't like to see it only as a burden because you know what? In some ways, it makes my life very, very rich and allows me to see things, right? It's kind of, the way I kind of see it is, you know, um, when people, you know, sometimes, let's say, you know, if you go blind, um, your other senses become so enlivened, right? In this way, the heaviness that some of us bear allow us to appreciate the relish of possibility much, much more than, I, I have colleagues, I wonder, what, what are you doing with your time? I'm not speaking just in terms of productivity, but in terms of, helping move the world forward. So in some ways, I'm grateful for it, but it is exhausting. But I try to come back to the aspects to be grateful, because in some ways, my life is much richer than many other people's. And that's not nothing, right? So thank you. I have one final question. Uh, at one point in your book, you're talking about the great migration in the early decades of the 20th century, made by millions of African Americans out of the Jim Crow South. Uh, you write that, quote, a people can move physically but can also shift spiritually. How would you relate that statement to the title of your presentation just now, Somewhere Between Hope and Tragedy, Race and the Blues of American Politics? Are we, can we hope to be experiencing a spiritual shift? I mean, I, we, ha we have to be, um, or, else, or, else, or else there's only doom, right? I mean, you know, America is always celebrated as a land of opportunity, and of course there's lots of opportunities here, right? Um, but it's also marked by undeniable forms of disadvantage, to put it mildly. Um, and if we, if we think that things are just as good as they're going to get, people will suffer. Somebody like myself, um, I can now navigate through some of these things despite, right? But there's, for every one of me, for every one of my friends over here, um, there are thousands of people who are not navigating that. Um, and so it's improper to act as if, well, we have to kind of see how it goes. The idea of spiritual movement, I, I don't mean that in some divine sense, I mean that in terms of the language that's been used by a lot. Um, it's Gail Thomas. Uh, we, 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 that's the language that was used in the conversation, this idea of, of, this, of, this, of the human soul. Um, this idea of spirituality is something that I mean in a very kind of um, almost mundane sense about what it means to feel for the wellness of life for those beyond you. Um, and it is part, I argue consistently, it's part of the human condition that we have that capacity. And so I'm at the position that I always think the biggest challenge is not whether we have it, it's how we're failing to get it going. Right? And if we can get it going, then there is hope. And so thankfully for institutes like this and across the nation and the academy and people doing activism on, in, on the ground, they're all pitching in to keep the spirit of America moving. And we have to keep on doing that work or else there is no hope. But I do believe that we do have hope. Thus, we keep the work going. 
Dr. Christopher LeBron, thank you for being in Dallas. Thank you for the conversation. Thank you for your life and for your work. Thank you all as well. The Hyatt Prize is a cash award of $50,000. A couple of years ago, I asked one of the Hyatt winners, who was also a philosopher, what he planned to do with the money. And he said he was going to buy a grand piano. <laughs> so this morning, I asked Chris what he planned to do with the money. And he said he hasn't decided as yet. So maybe a saxophone? <laughs> OK. I have no idea how much a saxophone costs, but anyway. In any case, on behalf of the Dallas Institute of Humanities, I'd like to thank you for your scholarship that has such light and heat and grace. And I want you to know that we have high hopes for the work you will do in the coming years. Thank you. <laughs>